I grew up in a large family. I had two sisters and seven brothers. And when you think about it, that's probably the perfect training for a career in counterterrorism. <laughs> Before I left for Afghanistan, I called one of my brothers up. I wanted to put some more details in, in my will. And this brother was the executor of my estate. And I told him that this deployment I was going on, I'd been on a lot of dangerous ones before, but this was at a different level, I thought. And I told him I wasn't sure I'd make it back home. And I suppose I was looking for some words of consolation, a bit of empathy, maybe a tiny bit of brotherly love, and my brother thought about it for a couple of seconds, and he said, well, Mike, you've had a good ride. <laughs> In ancient times, a hero was someone of semi-divine birth who did impossible deeds. But I think that nowadays, our culture has cheapened our understanding and our use of the word hero. And what I'd like to share with you is just a few stories of who I think are real heroes and share with you my belief that the seeds of heroism are inside all of us. Witold Pilecki is a name that's difficult to pronounce, but it's a name that we should all know and all remember. He was an ordinary captain in the Polish army and in 1941, he took on a very, very dangerous mission. He volunteered, and that's the key word, he volunteered to be captured by the Gestapo so he could be taken to a concentration camp outside Krakow, Poland. And the reason for that was the Allies had no idea what was happening inside that concentration camp. This was 1941. So Pilecki gets arrested, and he sent to Auschwitz, and inside Auschwitz, he sets up a spy ring, and he smuggles intelligence out, and it gets into the, to the high command of the United States and of our British allies in London. And for the first time, he confirms that human beings are, extermin are being exterminated in large numbers in this camp. Later on, after a year and a half in Auschwitz, he escaped and he made his way back to help the Polish army to fight the Nazis. Well, at the end of World War II, the Soviet army took over Poland, and the Soviet Union installed a puppet government. So as a true patriotic Pole, he fought that government. He was captured, he was tried and convicted. One afternoon, his two young children, who were in grade school, heard over the school's PA system that their father had been executed for treason against Poland. It was not until decades later that they learned, I think they were in their 80s at the time, that their father was probably one of the greatest heroes of his generation. Maybe, I would argue, of any generation. Helga Bose was a young lawyer in Washington, D.C. in the late 90s, a graduate of Harvard Law School. He had his ticket punched to wealth and prestige. But that's not really what Helga wanted. In the late 90s, he saw what was happening in the world. He saw the Al-Qaeda attacks on two US embassies in East Africa in the summer of 1998. And he saw Al-Qaeda's attacks on the USS Cole, a Navy warship off the coast of Yemen in the fall of 2000, in which 17 US sailors were killed and 41 were wounded. Helga decided he wanted to defend the United States. So he applied to the Central Intelligence Agency. Now, the Central Intelligence Agency doesn't always make the best personnel decisions, but in hiring Helga Bose, this was an excellent one. He went through training, and he graduated from his training class just after the 9-11 attacks. And what did he do? He volunteered for Afghanistan. In CIA, that was all voluntary. He deployed to Afghanistan, he helped in the hunt for Osama bin Laden, and he collected intelligence on the whereabouts of other al-Qaeda and enemies of the United States. After months in perhaps one of the most dangerous places in the world, Helga went back to Washington for a month to recuperate, 
And then he volunteered again for a second deployment to Afghanistan. A week into that second deployment, Helga Bowes was killed. This was an enormous loss to the CIA. He had such great potential and an enormous loss to the United States. Since the 9-11 attacks, the United States has lost thousands of young people defending this country. I know this young man in particular, and so I know what we lost. So when I multiply that by thousands, I know what this country has lost. I, I believe that Helga was a hero. He had all the qualities. He faced danger, and he put others' interests in front of himself, and I think that's the essence of heroism. When I was a, an 11-year-old, I read a book that inspired me. It was juvenile literature. It was a book called Johnny Tremaine about a boy growing up in the American Revolution in Boston. The book was written by Esther Forbes, who was a Pulitzer Prize-winning author. Esther Forbes called her last chapter of that book, and I've never forgotten this name, A Man Can Stand Up. Today we'd say, a person can stand up. But this was 1943. Now, it took me a long time to realize that the book really was about much more than a coming-of-age story in Boston in 240 years ago during the American Revolution. Because Esther Forbes wrote this book in 1943 when millions of young American boys were being called up across this country, coming from every community, and being sent overseas to fight and die on the beaches of Normandy and in far-flung Pacific islands they didn't even know the name of. I would argue that each and every one of them had the seeds of heroism inside of them, and they were ordinary people. In the words of Esther Forbes, they stood up. Recently, in recent years, we've seen examples of this. Remember the American passengers on United 93 on the day of 9-11? Nothing very much worked in the U.S. favor that day. But one thing that worked was these brave passengers, having been informed that other planes had already struck the World Trade Center, knew they were in a dire situation. And what did they do? They did that American thing. They took a vote, and they voted to storm the cockpit. And in so doing, they prevented that plane from attacking the U.S. Capitol and slam, or slamming into the White House. Extraordinary, extraordinary acts of heroism. Now, we see other examples of this. And just before our very eyes over the last two years, I think the heroism of doctors and nurses and medical personnel combating this frightening disease that struck us, the farmers that kept producing food, the people working in supermarkets who, put food, uh, who made food available to us, the delivery people. These are small acts of heroism, but in my mind, heroism nonetheless. All these people had the seeds of heroism inside of them, and we need to admire that. I also I look at the challenges that this country faces in the future. Now, I think we like to think that we're going to have a respite sometime, a break from the difficulties in the world, but all you have to do is look around the world and see what's happening. The truth is, there's always going to be another Vladimir Putin in the world invading an innocent country and causing untold suffering. There's always going to be a Kim Jong-un or another megalomaniac obsessed with a cult of death. There's going to be wars, pandemics, droughts. I'm afraid this is just the human condition. But what I like is we have everyday heroes that stand up because they have the seeds of heroism inside of them. Now, I don't want to paint just a completely bleak picture of the landscape because I believe that it's ennobling that human beings will actually put others in and their welfare in front of their own safety and security. I think that's divinely inspired. One of the great honors of my life was to serve on the 9-11 Commission and to, to be under the leadership of the co-chairs of that commission, Governor Tom Kane and Lee Hamilton. They were models of integrity and honesty, and they, their leadership, they insisted that 
partisanship be left at the door and that we find out the facts and circumstances surrounding the attacks on the United States and to make recommendations to keep the country safe. And for their leadership, they're actually my personal heroes. I always like to think of and thank the police, firefighters, EMTs, medical personnel, everybody that's protecting us and our society. I believe they deserve our admiration and, and respect. I've been deployed overseas in dangerous places with the US military. And I know from that experience that even ordinary tasks that our military is, is in daily can be fraught with danger. Serving on ships, serving on submarines, crewing aircraft, overflying hostile lands. And I always like to think of the 18-year-old young Americans who, at any moment, are on the front lines in desolate, dangerous, scary places, and to remember them and to know that they have the seeds of heroism inside of them. We Americans, when we face new situations that are scary, we stand up. We see what's happening. We lift our heads. We don't wait for others to tell us what to do. We see what needs to be done. We figure it out, and we bring our advantages to bear, and we act. That's what really gives me hope. That's what gives me hope, because that's the essence of heroism, and I believe it's in all of us. Thank you. Peace.